like the second passage. I did not like this third passage, the AB set, and I was a philosophy major. This is boring ass shit, man. All right, first passage talking about the both passages are discussions of our obligations or rights towards evildoers, specifically liars. And in the first passage, uh, the author lays out two separate questions. First, does the liar deserve to be lied to? And she says, sure. Um, you know, liar doesn't have a claim to be told the truth. But second, are you more justified in lying to a liar than to someone else? So the second claim is more about the, the respondent, you know? The first claim is about the object, the liar. Does that person have a, a right to the truth? And the second, second claim is about the subject, the uh, person talking to the liar. Does that person find justification for lying? And she says in the first, the liar doesn't deserve the truth, but in the second, uh, the harm in line 24, the harm to yourself, to others, and to general trust that can come from lying, don't justify lying even to a liar. All right. And passage B is worse. That first sentence of passage B is providing exactly the opposite view to St. Augustine's view, um, but doing so using a million words, where St. Augustine's view in passage A is laid out explicitly and clearly, Instead, we get, uh, by virtue of their status as rationally, they implicitly authorize similar. It's just awful. And I don't know why I'm complaining so much. I just felt like, I, I guess it's because I don't feel well and I don't want to read this. I'm a whiny ass baby. Uh, all right. So this concludes the opposite of St. Augustine. You absolutely can lie to liars. You can treat evildoers as they've treated you. Uh, I'm in line 50. Now, it's a duty. It's I'm sorry. It's not a duty. It's a right, not a duty. You don't have to lie to somebody who's lied to you, but you do have the right because uh, rational beings in line 50 can't object to being treated in the way which they treated others. All right. Passage A, there's two questions and we ultimately shouldn't really lie to liars. Uh, passage B, we absolutely have that right. All right, both passages are concerned in question 15 with answering which of the following questions. How do we treat people who behave badly? Is it right to respond to a person's wrongdoing with an action of the same kind? And that's just a main point question, essentially. For 16, we want something that's in A but not in B. So um, where did the author say that the harm or where the author talk about the harm that may result as a consequence. And this is something we talked about when we were discussing the main idea of A. Uh, it's in line 24, the harm to self and others in general trust. And that idea just doesn't appear anywhere in passage B. For 17, how do we support the idea that both passages D suggest a view can have unreasonable consequences? Well, the first sentence of passage A makes that suggestion proceeding against lies by lying would be like countering robbery with robbery. That's unreasonable. That's the whole point of the analogy. Um, and then in passage B, I'm in the middle of the second paragraph. The, assert the assertion of a duty to punish, I'm in line 42, seems excessive. Why? Because then in line 44, we'd have a duty to do to all rational persons everything that they do to others. And it points out the unreasonableness of uh, taking the notion of lying to liars as a duty rather than as a right. And that's the kind of evidence that we need to be able to have in order to support the right answer. For question 18, passage A would agree with answer choice C. It can be unjustified to treat a person in a certain way. Why? How do we know that's true? Because the author says it. Uh, in line, I mean, then we keep coming back to the same point in the passage. And this is something we were talking about in an earlier passage too, is like the test writers latch onto an idea from a passage and just hammer it and hammer it and hammer it. And here it is that idea that uh, there were two questions in passage A. Does the liar deserve to be told the truth? No, no, she doesn't. But second, are you justified in lying to a liar? And no, no, you're not. It can be unjustified to treat a person in a certain way, even though they don't deserve anything better. 
So for 19, how do we know that in passage A, the kind of right involves behavior that one is entitled to from others? Because look at what the author says there. Bullies forfeit the right not to be interfered with. Liars forfeit the right to be dealt with. What are they forfeiting? A right dealing with how other people treat them. And in passage B, uh, in line 50, we have a right. What is the right that we have? The right is how we can treat others. So in passage A, it's about how others treat you. In passage B, it's about how you treat others. And that's how we can support answer choice either. Question 20 is just like a resolution question from logical reasoning. How do we reconcile the fact that in passage A, we say the harmless pathological liar doesn't have any claim not to be lied to, but still, still, uh, these tall tales don't constitute sufficient reason to lie to him. And yet, in passage B, we say that when rational beings act immorally, then they authorize similar actions. On the one hand, we're saying that the liar uh, does not give a sufficient reason to lie to him. On the other, we say that rational beings do authorize us to lie to them. And when you put it like that, you can kind of see the way through, right? And it's the same route that answer choice B takes. The pathological liar is not a rational being. And that gets us out of the jam, and it explains how we can deal with pathological liars differently than Kant dealt with rational beings. And that is this third passage.